If you have your copy of God's Word, I invite you to turn to the book of Romans, chapter 8. We're going to take a one-week break from our journey through the Gospel of Luke to consider what I think is one of the greatest verses in the Bible. I'm, I'm sure you're not supposed to have favorite verses uh, because all of the Bible is inspired. All of it points to Christ. Uh, but Romans 8 uh, speaks so plainly and so clearly of this hope that we have. So I just want us to focus on one verse this morning. One verse that teaches us what we need to know Christ has done that we might be saved. This is Romans 8, verse 34. The Apostle Paul writes to the church at Rome. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? Who is at the right hand of God? Who indeed is interceding for us? This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together and ask for God's wisdom as we consider this text together. Lord, I thank you for your word, that it is true, that it is inspired, without error of any kind. Lord, it tells us the truth about who you are and who we are. And Lord, this verse today we're considering tells us about the work that Christ has done for us and the work that Christ is now doing for us. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds, and fill us with your truth by the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that as I preach this morning, that your words would be heard and not my own. Father, that you would receive all the glory. In the name of Christ, I pray these things. Amen. Are you ever afraid that you just won't measure up? Are you ever concerned that you're just... Not good enough. You compare yourself to other people and think other people are just better than you, whether they're better Christians or better parents or better employees, more successful. Are you anxious about some kind of rejection by someone's significance? Are you afraid of feeling condemned in some way? Maybe you're afraid of feeling condemned before God this morning. And a number of years ago, I had an experience. I was pursuing a job I had applied for. It was a job that I, I was desiring to do, and it would have been a, a good thing for me, I think, to get this job and to be involved in this career. It would have provided lots of connections, lots of opportunities, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, so I, I, I started this interview process, and I thought it was going really well. You know, there was a series of interviews, and I seemed to hit it off with each uh, stage of the interview. I met the other folks I would have been working with, and we seemed to get along well. About a month, these interviews went on, and the individual in charge of actually making the hire told me that there were two candidates left and that I was one of them. And so I thought, that's 50-50 odds. That's pretty good. I got excited about the prospect of a new job new faces, new people, all that kind of stuff that goes along with that, new experiences. And then that phone call came where the supervisor told me that they were going with the other candidate. I was just devastated. I had put a lot of hope, a lot of effort, a lot of time and money into pursuing this other job. And I asked the interviewer, what, what was it? Like, why did you not choose me? Why did you choose the other guy instead of me? And he didn't really give any concrete details. He just said that the other candidate was a better fit. And I would have rather him told me that I was, you know, I had some, some kind of deficiency than just to hear that. But it was just like, we don't really want you. We want him instead. And man, does that make you feel crummy? Maybe you've had an experience like that. To hear you were pretty good but not quite good enough. Here you had a lot to offer, but not quite enough to satisfy the demands of a job. Your work got you close, but it didn't quite get you all the way there. 
And though my interviewer didn't say this, he was very nice and cordial and professional about it. When I heard those words that they were going with the other candidate, oh, I felt condemned. I felt about this big. I didn't measure up. I wasn't good enough. I didn't have enough experience or I didn't work hard enough. I was condemned in that moment. Let me ask you, are you feeling condemned this morning? Do you feel like you are constantly working and striving at something and it always just seems to be beyond your grasp but you can't really reach it? Do you feel like a lousy Christian today? Like you just don't measure up. You look at your life and you look at your sin and you just think, how on earth could God love me? Maybe you're not sure you're a Christian at all today. In this verse we see this question. Who is to condemn? Paul's asking the church there, the Christians at Rome, who are you afraid will condemn you? And the answer to this question is Jesus. You know, on the last day, it is Jesus who will condemn. Think about that for a moment. That means his condemnation will be just. That means if the whole world gives you approval, but Christ condemns you, it is only Christ and His opinion that matters. It is only His verdict that carries any weight. But friends, if that is true, then the opposite is true. If Christ does not condemn you, who is there to condemn you? If Christ just says, you are justified, you are righteous, you are sinless, why should we care what anybody else thinks about us? Would you rather have the approval of the world and the condemnation of the Savior or the approval of the Savior, though the world condemns you? Paul tells us very plainly what is to be desired in this text. Friends, though Jesus will be the righteous judge on the last day, if Christ is your Savior, He will not be your judge. Jesus is the one who will ultimately condemn, but if Jesus doesn't condemn you, what are you afraid of? What do you fear? If the God of all the universe approves of you, what other approval do you need? You might say, well, pastor, that sounds well and good, but how can I be sure that God will approve of me on that last day? How can I be sure that I will not face condemnation? The main idea of this text is very clear and straightforward. You might say it's the message of the whole Bible. It's the message that Christ's work saves. It's Christ's work and His work alone that saves sinners from their sins. You're not saved by your own works. You're not saved by your own righteousness. You're not saved because you pray or because you read the Bible or because you come to church on Easter. Though I'm glad you do all of those things. If anyone is saved, it will be because they are saved by Christ and because of His work on their behalf. And I think Paul is urging us to think about Christ's work in two ways in this text. And this will be helpful for us moving forward. The first is to think about what Jesus did. That which is accomplished. That which is finished. And the second is what Jesus is doing. And friends, I don't think that's something we we think about quite often enough. But there's two ways that Christ is at work. What he has done and what he is doing. Let's look at each in turn. First, notice Christ's righteous obedience saves. Paul begins with this question. Who is to condemn? And condemnation is not a hypothetical reality. It's it's a true condition some people will experience. The Bible teaches that very plainly. Any person who has given a considerable amount of thought to the reality of the afterlife, will have to grapple with this question. They'll have to grapple with the thought that they might be condemned on that last day. So who is the one who will do the condemning on the last day? It's not your parents. It's not your teachers. It's not your employer. But the one who will condemn on the last day is Jesus. He will come, he will return, and he will judge the living and the dead. All people will be judged by God on the last day. And there are two verdicts which God will give. Guilty or righteous. That's it. 
On the last day, you'll get one of those two verdicts pronounced over you. Either you're guilty or you're righteous. Which side do you want to be on? Which verdict do you desire to receive? In saying that God is the one who condemns, in saying that Jesus is the one who condemns, what he's saying is that Jesus' condemnation will be just. That is, Jesus is a just judge. He judges with purity. That when he says something, it is true. Jesus does not lie. So if God condemns you, Nobody else's opinion matters. If God condemns you, you are condemned. No one else can save you. How sad is the fate of those on whom God pronounces condemnation? It is a horror and a terror I wish upon none of you who could hear my voice. But you notice in this text, God, Paul does not ask this question so that the church at Rome might feel condemned. He asks this question so that the church at Rome might know that they are righteous. How might they know they are righteous? Well, it's because Jesus Christ is the one. Jesus is the Christ. That word Christ means anointed one. He is the one sent from God who will save their people from their sins. Jesus is the seed promised to come from the woman who will crush the serpent's head. Jesus is the promised son from the line of Abraham, who will be a blessing to all of the nations. Jesus is the prophet greater than Moses, who will keep all the law of the Lord. Jesus is the true son of David, who will rule and reign perfectly on behalf of God's people. Jesus is the focal point of human history, the one by whom and for whom all things were created. Jesus is the one who will bring us to the Father. He is the one who will send us us, the Spirit. Jesus is the one. We must understand what Jesus has done for us. Friends, I think we often think about the fact that Jesus has died for us, but consider with me for a moment this morning that Jesus also lived for us. Every time you have told a lie, Jesus has spoken that which is true. Every time that you have coveted someone else's possessions, someone else's stuff, Someone else's status. Jesus has been content. Every single time you have lashed out in sinful anger, Jesus expressed a quiet, firm trust in the Lord. Every time you've been unfaithful to God, Jesus has been faithful to God. Jesus is the second Adam, the last Adam, the faithful one who will obey every command that is given to him, that he might merit life. And righteousness for all his people. Consider what Paul says in Romans 5, 19. It says, for by one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. That's Adam. So, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. This is how we get to be righteous. Not by our obedience, but by Christ's obedience. Had Jesus not obeyed the laws of God, we could not be saved. He would not be a lamb without blemish. He could not take away the sins of the world. But the good news of the gospel is that Jesus, who was God and man, was perfectly obedient to his Father, obeying every part of the law. Jesus did everything that was necessary to fulfill the law's demands. The Bible teaches us that Jesus became obedient unto death. That is, Jesus did not stop obeying the Father when the going got tough, when the cross loomed on the horizon. Jesus didn't say, oh my Father, I don't want to walk down the road to Calvary. Give me an easier way. No, He was obedient, even unto death. Friends, that's a reminder to us that obedience does not guarantee an easy life. For Jesus was perfectly obedient in all things, and yet He lived amongst the poor. He was ridiculed persecuted and mocked, and yet he was perfect. Never a trace nor a stain of sin. The perfect, active obedience of Christ is necessary for our salvation. Jesus came and lived a perfect life, not so that he might condemn us, 
but to give us that righteousness which he has achieved by his perfect obedience on our behalf. And Christ's obedience led him not just to a life of hardship, but a life of sacrifice. You see, the gospel teaches us not just that Jesus righteously obeyed, but secondly, that Christ's sacrificial atonement saves. You see, if Christ was perfectly obedient, but never died upon Calvary's cross, we would have the right to fear condemnation today. Paul says is Christ Jesus is the one who died. You catch that? The perfect one, the righteous one, he died. What does the death of Christ mean? Well, it is only in the dying of Christ that we might be made alive. Scripture tells us that Jesus was obedient unto death. That is, the cross of Calvary was in no way an accident, but it was a voluntary act of the Savior to redeem his people from their sins. That he would bear the curse in their place by dying upon the cross. You know, the suffering of Jesus began before the cross, but it culminated in that act of crucifixion. Jesus being murdered for crimes that others had committed. In thinking of this, I think it's important that we think of Jesus as the great high priest on our behalf. You know, in the Old Testament, when you read about the priesthood, you read about the priests, you really see them doing two primary things. There's other activities that they do, but there's two primary things that they do. They pray for the people, and they offer sacrifice on behalf of the people. Notice Jesus, your great high priest. What are two things that we see him doing in that week of his passion? We see him praying for his people. We see him offering sacrifice on behalf of of his people. You see, in the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament, the priest would offer an animal for the sins of the people, and then he would go into that inner chamber, into the holy place, and he would intercede for the people, for their sins, begging God for his mercy. You know, Jesus, prior to his crucifixion, he prays. What prayers are on the lips of the Savior before he marches? up the hill of Calvary. What does Jesus pray for? Jesus knew the crucifixion was coming the next day. What does he pray for that night? He prays for many things, but one of the things that he prays for is for you. John 17 tells us this. John 17, 9 and 10. says, I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And then down in verse 20, I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. Friends, if you're a Christian today, Jesus prayed for you before he marched up the hill to Calvary. Before your sins were placed upon Jesus' shoulders, your name was upon his lips. We can imagine Jesus praying to his Father, saying, Oh Father, I am going to save my people. I am going to do your will. I am going to bear their sins. Oh Lord, you are going to save your people. Father, strengthen me for this task. Do you see the love of the Savior for sinners like you and me? The importance of the cross is not simply that Christ died, but that He died as a sacrifice, as a substitute for sinners. That He who was without sin became sin, that we might become the righteousness of God. The older authors would speak of Jesus as a surety. And that word is, 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 means a person who takes responsibility for another person's performance, a guarantor. An older author, Thomas Boston, he says this. He says, when Christ came to offer up his sacrifice, he stood not only in the capacity of a priest, but also in that of a surety. And so his soul stood in the stead of ours, and his body in the stead of our body. We should meditate upon that fact. That Jesus Christ, 
The the anointed one, the chosen one of God, the maker of heaven and earth. He died upon Calvary's cross, bearing the sins of all those he came to save. He saw his mission through to the bitter end, crying out, it is finished, accomplishing salvation for all his beloved. Friends, there's not one sin of Christ's people that he did not pay for upon the cross. An older author with the last name Brockle, Father Brockle, he's called in the Dutch tradition, he says this. He says, Christ has suffered as surety, becoming the substitute for those for whom he suffered. He suffered, taking upon himself all their sins. That is, original sin and the actual sins committed from the beginning to the very end of their lives. Thus, by his suffering and death, He satisfied the righteousness of God on their behalf, removed all temporal and eternal guilt and punishment, merited eternal life for them, and made them heirs of eternal salvation. Have you considered what Jesus did for you upon the cross? Jesus did not die to cleanse from sins generally. He died to cleanse you from specific sins. For your sins, every bitter thought, every evil deed, every careless word, every sinful action, Jesus took every one of your sins by name to the cross. His love for his father and his love for his bride drove him to to endure the most bitter pangs of death, even death on a cross. The glorious news of the gospel is that because God has judged Jesus for your sins. He will not judge you for your sins. That's our hope today. Not that we're good people. Not that we dress up nice on Easter. But that Christ has borne our sins upon the cross of Calvary. Our great high priest has prayed for his people name by name. And he has atoned for their sins one by one. No drop of blood spilled on Calvary's cross was wasted. Every single one of all of the sins of all God's people was paid upon Calvary's cross. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who will pronounce judgment. He will judge with justice, but he has not condemned his people. Rather than condemn his people, he he died for them. He has secured their salvation by his perfect life and sacrificial death. If Jesus isn't going to condemn you, then who is left to condemn you? Whose opinion really matters if Jesus doesn't condemn you? The answer to that is no one. If Christ declares you righteous, then you are righteous. Friends, do you believe that Jesus and His work is enough to save you? Or do you feel like you must add to that which Christ has already done? Friends, you could never. But the good news of the gospel is that it is finished. It is accomplished. That Christ has done it. And He did it for you. That you might not be condemned, but that you might be made righteous in His sight. But notice the death, of the, the death of Christ is not the end of the story. That is not the end of what he has done for us. Notice thirdly this morning, that Christ's glorious resurrection saves. You see, Paul says, Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. I think it's easy for us to consider Christ's death on the cross, saving us, paying for our sins. But what do we think of the resurrection? Was that just the cherry on top? No, the resurrection has purpose for the Christian. In fact, consider what Paul says about the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Friends, if the resurrection isn't true, we should all go home. We should not only cancel this Sunday, but we should cancel every Sunday. If Christ is not raised, then we are not justified. But the good news of the gospel is that Christ lives. 
He is alive forevermore. Paul says we should be pitied above all people if we only have hope while we are still living. That is, if Christ is still in the grave, we are the densest and the dumbest people in the world to live our lives with such sacrifice. If we only have hope in this life, Paul says we really don't have much hope at all. But our hope is not for this life, but for the next If Christ is alive, then we will be alive forevermore with Him if our faith is in Him. We had a good Friday service. Friday night, a wonderful time of singing, of reading Scripture, and remembering what Christ has done on the cross. And perhaps this week you've spent time reflecting upon that horrible, horrible fate the Savior underwent for you. You're thinking about how bad your sin is, that it would cause Jesus to undergo such torture and such pain. Have you spent any time this week in considering what Jesus did for you when he rose from the dead? Have you considered that Jesus did not only die for you, but he rose for you? He rose that you might be justified. The resurrection of Christ is the cornerstone of all of our hope. When Christ rose from the dead, the firstborn of all creation, what it showed to the world is that the Father's plan to redeem sinners had come to pass. That Jesus' sacrifice on the cross was effective. That it is finished. Love's redeeming work is done. And Christ's sacrifice and resurrection did not make salvation possible. As if Jesus did 99% of the work and we just have to do 1%. Friends, if we have to do 1% of the work, we are still dead in our trespasses and sins. But the glory of the gospel is that Christ did it all. And the resurrection proves that it is finished. That Jesus rose to justify you. Looking into the empty tomb, you can know that God has declared you righteous if your faith is in Christ. Imagine with me for just a moment that Jesus never rose from the dead. Well, first of all, that would make Jesus to be a liar. Right? Because all throughout his earthly ministry, he was telling people that he was going to rise from the dead. So if Jesus had lived a perfect life, but had died upon Calvary's cross... And never risen from the dead. But we would still be in our sins. Maybe, perhaps, Christ might have paid for sins. But he could not have given us his righteousness. If he were still dead and in the tomb. Friends, you see, we don't only need to be forgiven. We need to be declared righteous. I want us to understand that the cross. Jesus' substitution on the cross. He purchased for us forgiveness of sins. But in the resurrection... He declares us righteous. We serve a risen Savior. So look into the empty tomb today and see that Christ is not there. And He is risen. And look into the empty tomb today and know that just as we no longer see Christ's dead body, the Lord no longer looks upon you to see your sin. But He sees Christ and His righteousness. He does not see your sin, though you are a sinner. He does not see your shame, though you've acted shamefully. He does not see your shortcomings, though we've all fallen short of His glory. No, if your faith is in Christ, this very hour, when God looks down upon you, He sees His Son, Jesus Christ, in His perfect righteousness. He does not treat you as a lawbreaker who must earn his way back into God's good graces, but as a son or a daughter adopted into the family of God, with all the benefits of knowing God as a father. The work of Christ in the resurrection assures us that all of our sins, every last one of them, has been atoned for by our Lord Jesus Christ. Brockle again says this. He says, There is not one sin, not even the least part thereof, for which satisfaction has not been made. And therefore, they are free from all guilt and punishment. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. Christ has done it. And he has proven that his work upon the cross is effectual because he has risen from the dead. Friends, this is true for every person who has believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no work that we could do that could pay for the penalty of sins. But Christ has done it. And he has done it completely. Paying for all of your sins. 
And the empty tomb shows us that His work is accomplished. He is alive forevermore, having nailed our own miserable sin to His cross. And if He has borne our penalty, we have every reason to rejoice greatly today. If Christ is alive forevermore, then we can have hope that as He is, we too one day will be. But the good news doesn't end at the resurrection, friends. Paul continues here in verse 34. Notice lastly, number four this morning, that Christ's intercession as our mediator saves. You know, we stand up on Easter and say he is risen. But I wonder how often we contemplate the question, okay, he's risen, but what's he doing? I mean, Jesus isn't here bodily, but what is Jesus doing today? Is he just sitting and waiting? Well, Paul tells us what Jesus is doing today. You've noticed so far we've spoken of what Christ has done. He lived. He died upon the cross. He suffered. He was buried. He rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven. But friends, we don't worship a risen Christ who was. We worship a risen Christ who is. He is alive, actively working for us in our salvation. Look at the text again. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised. And notice Paul switches the tense of his verb. That's important. Uh, None of you are, few of you are grammarians, I know. But it's important for us. we're, We're moving from something Jesus has done to something Jesus is doing. You notice that who is at the right hand of God and who indeed is interceding for us. So what's Jesus doing today? At least two things. He is sitting and he is interceding. He is praying. Let's take each of those in turn. First, he is at the right hand of God. Hebrews 8.1 tells us this. Now, the point in what we are saying is this. We have such a high priest, one who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in heaven. The author of Hebrews wants us to know that our high priest did not stop being our high priest when he ascended into heaven. He has just changed his post. He's relocated to a better place. Jesus has sat down at the right hand of the Father. And from there, he has all authority and might and power. And he executes that for our good. It's it's significant that Christ has sat down. Hebrews 10, 11 and 12 says this. And every priest stands daily at his sacrifice, at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. The priest would stand up every day and do his priestly service. What is Jesus doing? He's not standing. He's sitting down. Why? Because his sacrifice was enough. It finished the work that God came to do to justify and redeem sinners. He is a great high priest. Better than the priesthood of old. Christ is the perfect Lamb of God. Who takes away the sin of the world. He's offered his sacrifice once for all and has sat down at the right hand of God. So what is Jesus doing today? He's sitting at the right hand of the Father awaiting that day. When he will return in power. But friends, whenever Jesus ascended into heaven, he did not forget about his people. He did not forget about those he died to save. Rather, he ascended into heaven so that he might pray for his people. Paul tells us that Jesus is interceding right now. That the resurrected Christ is praying. And praying is simply talking to God. Your great high priest bends the ear of his father to plead your case, to speak your name. Hebrews 7, 25. Consequently, he is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Consider that the reason you are saved is because Christ has prayed for your salvation. God has heard his perfect righteous plea on your behalf and he has saved you. 
He is praying as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that his church might be one. He is praying that you would be strengthened with the power of the Holy Spirit. He is praying that you would resist temptation. He is praying for your perseverance, which is one of the only guarantees that we will persevere. And so at the right hand of God, Jesus is praying for his people that you are on your Savior's lips even this moment. Have you considered what good news that is? John Owen says this, he says, So he prays for all them who are given him of his Father, that they may be where he is to behold his glory. Jesus won't stop praying for you until that day when you are forevermore with him. Isn't that good news? The Savior who has risen from the grave, ascended into heaven, continues as our intercessor, as our mediator. He is praying for all those he has called to himself. So friends, when the bottom falls out, when you feel lousy, when your heart condemns you and the world condemns you and the devil condemns you and you think, am I even a Christian? Think about the fact that the Savior is praying for you. When you don't know how to pray, Jesus is praying for you. When you you just groan to heaven, Jesus cares for you. He intercedes for you. For you. As our mediator, who is God and man, he brings our deepest needs before the throne of God. And because he is divine, he and he alone can pray for every one of his people at every moment. You know, I was with a group of people this week, and uh, we we're about to begin a meeting. And at the beginning of the meeting, there were some prayer requests that were kind of shared around. And there was uh, one man who was asked, Would you, would you open us in prayer? And none of us had written anything down. And so he, he starts to pray. And he's, Lord, I pray for this, and I pray for that, and I pray for this, and I pray for that. And uh, he, he remembered to pray for most of the things we had talked about. And then he said, Amen. And then he said, Oh, shoot, I, I, I forgot to pray for this. And so we, we all kind of comically bowed our heads. Lord, we pray for this. Amen, right? Have you ever forgotten to pray about something? Can I just remind you that Jesus doesn't? That Jesus never forgets you. He will never forget to pray for something that you need. Nothing goes unnoticed. Your great high priest does not condemn you. He's lived a perfect life for you. He's died a sacrificial death for you. He rose from the dead to justify you and he prays for you this very hour. Friends, we have a great high priest who is worthy of all of our trust, all of our honor, and all of our praise. And friends, this is the hope of every Christian. But I want to speak for a moment to those of you who are here who may not be Christians, who might not be converted, those of you who have not trusted Christ. If you are not a Christian, then these wonderful benefits that I've been speaking of for the past half hour Friends, I don't know how to say it any more clearly. They are not yours. These benefits are only for those who are in Christ. Those who belong to the Savior. I I say these things not because I'm mean and nasty and want you to feel bad. But because I want you to know these benefits. I want you to know the joy of being in Christ. I want you to know the joy of of having an an intercessor, a mediator. I want you to know these things. And the good news of the gospel is that you can. If you come to Christ, you leave behind your sin, repent, and place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of sinful men. I pray this very hour that the Holy Spirit might convict you of your many sins, might draw you to Himself, That you might know the joy of worshiping a resurrected Christ. I pray pray these things that you might have peace with God. And friends, if you know today you're not a Christian and and you want to be one, please don't leave before you speak with me. So I can tell you of Christ's love. I can tell you what it means to follow Christ. It is only those who are in Christ who experience Christ's benefits. So if you are in Christ today, I pray you're encouraged. And I pray that you walk out of here feeling like a Christian today knowing that God loves you and that Jesus is alive forevermore. But if you are not a Christian, I pray you don't deceive yourself into thinking otherwise. Come to Christ. He will not cast you out. He died for sinners. 
He loves sinners. Come to him. And if you are in Christ, let me just encourage you with these words. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Christ's love was poured out on Calvary's tree. Christ's love was shown when He rose from the dead. Christ's love is promised as He intercedes from the right hand of God. And nothing can separate you from the love of your Savior.